The coronavirus shows us that we die if our lungs cannot extract enough oxygen from the air. Other reasons exist why we do not have enough oxygen in our blood. This is why we will have a look at non-invasive, simple and cheap oxygen sensors and find out if they are useful and how they work. Gritzy YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Remember, if you subscribe, you will always sit in the first row. First of all, I'm no medical doctor nor a chemist. I'm an engineer. So forgive me if my explanations are straightforward and maybe even wrong. My goal is not to understand how it works in the body or chemically. My goal is to find out how we can use this relatively new technology and create something useful. Why are we interested in measuring oxygen levels in our blood? The first application is the long-time monitoring of patients in hospitals. This is especially important now during the corona crisis. If we do not have enough medical personnel, a device can monitor the oxygen level and alarm if it starts to drop. And another application is more common, to check if we suffer from sleep apnea. If so, you stop breathing for quite a while during sleep. Your brain can cause this if it does not give the right signals for breathing, or if you snore, your way to the lung is closed. In both cases, your lung does not get enough oxygen and the so-called SpO2 level sinks. If you go to the doctor, he or she provides you with two things. A device that detects if you stop breathing and for how long. And you get such an oxygen meter, also called oximeter, to assess the effect on your blood. If you do not breathe, your oxygen level drops, of course and low levels of oxygen can create health problems and have to be treated, usually by such a continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP device, which uses a mask to create pressure in your nose or mouth to keep your airways open. As an engineer, I could say, let's turn the logic and save some money. Look first if we find an effect in the blood. Such an oximeter costs us only a few dollars, much less than a visit to the doctor, at least where I live. And if we detect low SpO2 levels, we go to the doctor to determine the reason. As I said, I'm not a medical doctor and my advice might be dangerous for you. But it is for sure better to do these blood oxygen measurements than doing nothing if you suspect a problem. But how can we measure oxygen levels in blood? Blood transports oxygen attached to hemoglobin. If all hemoglobin has oxygen attached, we can call it 100%. If only 80% of your hemoglobin has oxygen attached, you have a severe problem because your organs and muscles do not get enough oxygen. Normal ranges for people without pulmonary pathology are from 95 to 99%. In the early days, measurements were done by pricking the patient with a needle to take some blood and analyze it in a device. If you need exact values, you still do it this way today. But of course, this video would not exist if only this method would be known, because I cannot see blood and a one-time analysis is not enough for most cases. Fortunately, in 1972, two Japanese improved a concept introduced in 1935 by a German and built a non-invasive instrument for measuring the oxygen saturation using light. How does this work? As said before, hemoglobin transports oxygen in the blood. If it carries oxygen, it is called oxygenated hemoglobin, or HbO2. Offloaded, it is called deoxygenated hemoglobin, or Hb. Absorption spectra of HbO2 and Hb are different and look like that. If you measure and compare the transparency of blood at around 660 nanometers and above 870 nanometers, you get signals which heavily depends on the mix of HbO2 and Hb. And you can calculate the percentages. Cool! 
and it does not hurt. But you might think that such a device hurts the wallet. Because if doctors use it, it must be expensive. Right. Let's check. We need a few things to get this so-called peripheral oxygen saturation or SpO2 value. A place where the transparency of blood can be measured. Light emitters for the two different wavelengths. Light detectors for the same wavelength and a computer to calculate and display the values. In principle, transparent things can be measured from one side or from two sides. If you measure from one side only, you need something which reflects the light. And you only get half the light in your detector. If you measure from two sides, you do not need a mirror. But you must not have light blocking areas between the emitter and the detector. You see, both principles have advantages and disadvantages. Here I have two single-sided and a few dual-sided sensors. And later we can do some tests with both. And of course, take one apart, as Dave would say. In hospitals, they mostly use the two-sided method. Wikipedia lists some reasons which suggests that the transmissive way is more precise. We can check it later. Places with lots of blood which can be reached from both sides typically are earlobes or fingertips. In the video we will use devices for the fingertips. They look like that and you put your finger in between the two parts. Springs keep them clamped to your finger. As soon as you switch them on, they light up and start to measure. And we see that they not only display oxygen saturation, they also measure the pulse because there is more or less blood in the finger depending on its pressure. The pulse reading is quite accurate. Let's take one of them apart to see how it works. As expected, it consists of two PCBs, one with an LED and one with a photodetector and some sorts of electronics. Their price starts at $14, including Bluetooth functionality. The diode looks like a standard LED. Fortunately, I have a spectrometer from my IR project in video number 269 and we can check it out. And here is the result. This diode emits red light at 660 nanometers and infrared at around 870 nanometers. According to Wikipedia, 660 nanometer is right on the spot. 870 nanometers is not. Wikipedia suggests to use 940 nanometers. But both blood curves are quite flat in this area. Looking at the other sensors, we see that all use the same wavelength. So I assume that this is OK. If we look at the chips, we see a Cypress ARM M0 MCU and two analog switches. Why do we need switches and quite a powerful MCU? Let me show the reason for the switches first. Here you see the oximeter in action. I switched the lights off to show you how the light penetrates the finger. The device measures 97% saturation. Now I switch the lights on. It is quite bright. But the meter still shows 97%. No influence. This independence on ambient light is, as usual, achieved by switching the LED on and off. If we take a photodiode and an oscilloscope, we see the switching. Like that, the MCU can remove the effect of ambient light. It seems they switch the light with 200 Hz. Please keep in mind, 5 volts is no light and 0 volt is full light. It also seems that they do not only turn the LED on and off, they modulate the intensity. Another question, how do they switch between the two wavelengths? The LED only has two pins. If we connect the second channel to the pin of the diode, we see what happens. Two different voltage levels drive the LED. One is positive and one is negative. 
The positive voltage emits IR light. Why do I know? I use an IR photodiode which mainly sees infrared. The negative voltage emits red light which is not very visible for my IR photodiode. Cost savings to the max. Hopefully the inventor got a bonus for that idea. Let's go on to the other device, a MAX30102 chip with an Arduino Uno. This chip uses reflected light and you get a library from SparkFun to drive it. Let's look at the raw data to estimate its performance. Here we see the amount of reflected light shown in serial monitor. The first thing we see is that we need a very high dynamic range. The difference between having my finger on the sensor or not is enormous compared with the variation induced by the blood. But because the serial monitor adjusts its scale automatically, after a while we see the heart rate. If I move the finger just a little, the signal changes a lot. It looks like this reflective method is quite shaky. And looking into the sketch, we also find a reason for the powerful ARM processor used in the other device. The Arduino does not have enough memory space. And maybe even not the required power for the 32-bit data cleansing. Let's check if we can measure the heart rate and the SpO2 level. Fortunately, we have a sketch for that. But the results are not very promising. The heart rate definitely is not right. This is why I also doubt that the SpO2 level is ok. I would not recommend this device for serious work. No surprise for me. My Polar watch displays the heart rate without SpO2 values. It has 6 green LEDs and still sometimes does not work correctly. No wonder most clinics use the transparent method. So let's concentrate on those meters and find the best. Because I wanted to do long time studies, I bought most of those finger meters with built in Bluetooth. Not a good idea, because their apps are crappy and unstable. If you only want a real time display, they work. But why would you copy the numbers on your smartphone and not read it from the sensor? You see, I'm not a digital native. I tested all of the sensors. This is easy, because fortunately we have 10 fingers. But because it's not easy to manipulate the oxygen levels in my blood, these tests are not representative. Maybe a free or apnea diver could help me out. I was not tough enough to stop breathing for a long time. But I did a sleep test where I connected myself to such a CPAP device. This is a medical device and usually is rented out by a medical service. Fortunately, you can buy them on eBay. And even better, you get an open source software to read its data. And in addition, this software can read data from a particular oximeter, the CMS 50D+. This meter stores the data for one night in memory. In the morning, you upload those data and synchronize it with the pressure data stored by the CPAP device. Usually it works. But as you see, I had to create some issues in the project. And now we can analyze. The doctors qualify an event if you stop breathing for more than 10 seconds. And this device can detect such events by measuring the pressure in the mask. They have to measure quite precise, maybe a topic of another video. Fortunately, I'm old enough to have some defects. This is why we see quite a few such events. And if we look at the oxygen levels, we see that they are lower during such events. Fortunately, not below 90%, which would be alarming. And I have another indication for its quality. This paper shows that an earlier model, the CMS 50DL, was ok. For my finger, it was also the most comfortable to wear. But this for sure depends on your anatomy. It is definitely more expensive than the others but well worth the money. And even more if you compare it with Western or doctor's pricing. Summarized, low oxygen levels in the blood are dangerous for humans. We know two basic ways of measuring its value, invasive and from outside the body. In this video we concentrated on so-called oximeters 
which measure SpO2 values using the transparency of blood. All of them use light sources on two wavelengths, red and infrared, to detect the ratio between saturated and free hemoglobin. All oximeters for fingers use the transparent mode, where the emitter is placed on one side of the finger and the detector on the other side. It seems to be clear that nail polish and other things blocking the distance between the emitter and the detector have to be avoided. We compared these transparent meters with an MAX3102 chip and an Arduino and found that they do not perform well. The Arduino also seems to be too weak for the number crunching needed to extract precise values. Most of the commercial devices use BLE to store data for long-term experiments. Unfortunately, their apps were not stable and I lost most of the data due to crashes. All BLE devices had no possibility to shut the display down during recording. Like that, batteries had to be replaced every morning. All devices do not work right with rechargeable batteries, because their voltage very fast becomes too low. The winner is the CMS 50D+. It stores data internally and can be connected to a software using USB. In a thorough test, a very similar device delivered good results. And it runs a few nights on one set of batteries because you can switch the display off. In CPAP environments, the CMS 50D Plus showed correlations between apnea events and lower SpO2 values. Thanks to other open source enthusiasts, we have software to read out data from the CPAP machine as well as the oximeter. This is why we are sometimes called hackers. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. You find the links in the description. Thank you. Bye.